The scripture is found in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. This is the word of the Lord. Last week we said that everybody wants to talk about Jesus, relate to Jesus, but we want to do it on our own terms. But the problem with that is that a Jesus that you make up, a Jesus that you create, uh, a Jesus that fits in with what you like to think Jesus should be, can't challenge you, can't contradict you, can't really, therefore, change you or transform you. If you want a Jesus that can really transform you, you have to find a Jesus with his own reality, a reality that you don't make up, that comes, that is a given, and we said the way to find the real Jesus, a Jesus with his own reality, would be to go to the New Testament Gospels. And we've begun to look at the first of those New Testament Gospels, Uh, The first one written, and the Gospels were there to make sure that the real Jesus was still something, even after the apostles and other eyewitnesses died, was something that we had access to. And so we've begun to look at the book of Mark. And today, tonight, Jesus makes his appearance. In these five little verses, we've got the whole history of the world recapitulated. Mark, as a writer, is characterized by incredible economy of style. He packs so much in to such a small amount of space. To unpack what's in these five verses, though, I've, had to, uh, I've, I've been helped oh, for years by my two main intellectual mentors, C.S. Lewis and Jonathan Edwards. Edwards, though, is much harder to read, and therefore I'm not giving you any quotes from Edwards because they just don't sound as good. They're not as lucid. Uh, to be read to you. So all of my quotes tonight will be from C.S. Lewis. What we learn in these five verses is that there's a dance. And the greatest need of your life is to get into that dance. And that Jesus is the one who can bring you in. There's a dance. The greatest need of your life is to get into that dance. Jesus is the one who can bring you in. First of all, what do I mean when I say there's a dance? Now, Look at verses 10 and 11. It's very very short here. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now, for you and me, characterizing the Spirit of God as a dove is not all that odd because, actually because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, it's a fairly common uh, image. But when uh, Mark was writing, it was very rare. In fact, there's only one place in Judaism where the Spirit of God is ever likened to a dove, and that is in the Targums, the Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Bible that the Jews of the time read because most of them uh, spoke Aramaic. It was the lingua franca. And in the Targums, in the creation account, Genesis 1-2, where it says the Spirit hovered across the face of the water, the Hebrew verb there is really the word flutter. Uh, it says the, uh, the Spirit fluttered across the face of the water, and as a result, to make it a little bit more vivid, the rabbis, when they translated and uh, the, wrote the Targums, wrote this down for Genesis 1 verse 2, and the earth was without form and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God fluttered above the face of the waters like a dove. And God spoke, let there be light. Now, there you have the creation, according to Genesis 1. There's three parties in the original creation of the world. There's God, there's God's Spirit, and there's God's Word, because he he creates through his Word. He speaks and it exists. Later on, John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, we're told, that, the, that, the, that as in Genesis we see God, God's Spirit, and God's Word, so it is that what happened at the beginning of the world was it was created by the triune God, the Father, 
the Word, or the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What Mark is deliberately doing here is he's drawing us back. He's pointing to the original creation in which you had the Father, and you had the voice, the Word, the Son, and you had the Holy Spirit fluttering like a dove. And Mark is saying just as the original creation of the world was a project of the triune God, so the recreation of the world, the salvation of the world, the renewal of the world that is beginning now is also a project of the triune God. Okay, fine. So that's what Mark is doing with all his illusions and images. So what? Why, was, why is it so important for us to understand that creation and redemption is the project of a triune God, a trinity, one God, three persons in that one God? Why is that so important? Now, I have to say on the surface of it, uh, let's face it, the trinity is difficult. The, t- the Christian teaching about the trinity is very difficult. It, it overloads the mental circuits. You know, they over, begin to overheat. Because what is, the, what is the doctrine of the Trinity? The doctrine of the Trinity is that God is one God, eternally existent in three persons. That's not tritheism. So there's really three gods who just stick together a lot and like each other. And it's not unipersonalism, which is, unipersonalism is there's really one God, and sometimes he takes this form and sometimes he takes this form, different forms in different places. There's really one God. No, no. The Trinitarianism is there's one God in three persons who know one another and love one another. And so God is not more fundamentally one than he is three, and he's not more fundamentally three than he's one. Well, you say, okay, that's difficult, it's mysterious, and it's, it is cognitively difficult, but the doctrine of the Trinity is bristling and exploding with life-shaping, wonderful, glorified, glorious implications that I would like to share with you. And the first one is that if it's true that this world has been created in the image of a triune God, then ultimate reality is a dance. How so? Well, look it. When Jesus comes up out of the water, the Father envelops him, covers him with words of love. You are my son whom I love. With you I'm well pleased. And the Spirit covers, envelops him with power. And the Bible says that when you see this, when you see what Mark is showing us here, when you see this, you're actually looking into the very heart of reality, the very meaning of life, see, the very essence of the universe, because it is what has been happening in the interior life of the Godhead from all eternity. It's a dance. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible, glorify one another. John chapter 17, each one glorifies the other. Now, what does that mean? C.S. Lewis and another uh, theologian, Cornelius Plantinga, put it like this. Let me read you the two quotes together. I'll interleave them, actually. C.S. Lewis says, in Christianity, God is not an impersonal thing or a static thing. He's not even just one person, but a dynamic, pulsating activity, a life, a drama, almost, if you will not think me irreverent, a kind of dance. And Cornelius planning it says, see, the Bible says that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit glorify one another. That means the persons within God exalt commune with, and defer to one another. Each harbors the others at the center of his being. In constant movement of overture and acceptance, each person envelops and encircles the others. God's interior life, therefore, overflows with self-giving love for others. And back to Lewis. So Lewis says, what does it all matter? It matters more than anything else in the world. For the whole dance or drama or pattern of this three-personal life is to be played out in each of us. They are the great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality, and there is no other way to the happiness for which we have been made. Now, why do they talk about the dance? Here's why. If you're going to graphically, physically uh, depict selfishness, selfishness is stationary. You know why? A self-centered life is a stationary life. It's a static life. It's not a dynamic life because a self-centered life wants everything to orbit around you. You might give to the poor, sure, 
as long as it makes you feel good about yourself and it doesn't cut too much into the way in which you live your life. You might help people. You might have friends. You might get fall in love as long as there's no compromise of your individual interests, of what makes you happy, of your needs. Self-centeredness, therefore, makes everything else a means to an end, and the end, the non-negotiable, is what I want and what I like, my interests over theirs. I'll, I'll, I'll play with people. I'll talk with people. But everything orbits around me. But the Godhead is utterly different. Instead of self-centeredness, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are characterized in their very essence by mutually self-giving love. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each person in the Godhead does not insist that any of the others revolve around them, but rather they center on one another. They glorify one another. They adore one another. They serve one another. They defer to one another. They put the interests of the other over their own interests, which means every one of them voluntarily goes out to, rev- to, to circle and to orbit around the others. But you see, if instead of everyone saying, no, you orbit around me, now think about this. Think about this. You have five people, six people, ten people, a hundred people up here, and every one of them wants to be self-centered. This can't be a dance. They all sit there. You dance around me. They're all up there. Nothing to watch. No dance. But when you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and each one is moving out toward the other instead of making the other come to them, orbiting around the other instead of insisting they, they orbit, the others orbit around them, you've got to dance. Dynamic, pulsating, let's see, a dance of joy. Each one pouring love and joy and adoration into the other. Each one deferring to the other. Each one serving the other. Each one putting the interests of the other over their own. And that's the dance. Now, what are the implications of that? If that is ultimate reality, if that's been going on from all eternity, if that's, what, what, if that's the God who made the universe... Do you realize the implications of it? Now, I've thought a lot about which implications to go into tonight. (laughs) And boy, there are some over over the centuries, and I mean the centuries, back as far as Augustine at least, some of the greatest thinkers in history have thought about how unique uh, the Christian teaching of the Trinity is. And it is unique, by the way. Listen, if you were making up Christianity, if you were making up a religion, would you ever come up with something like the Trinity? Absolutely not. I mean, to me, this is one of the strongest evidences that nobody made up Christianity. Because if you were making up a a doctrine of God, first of all, you'd never think of this. Who would think of it? But even if you thought about it, you'd never put it out there. Because, I mean, who in the world would believe it? You see? Christianity wasn't, Christianity will never be able, when its doctrine of God will never be able to compete with made up religions because they don't have to deal with facts. And we have to deal with the facts that God reveals about himself in the scripture. Having said that, over the years, people say this is unique. There is no other religion. There's nobody else that believes in God like this. And that makes the implications of this belief utterly changes the way in which you live your life in the world. For example, for example, and these are, these are some thinkers I'm not going to go into, and some of you are going to be very happy that I don't try. One, I remember I read one, one book, or a couple of thinkers, a bunch of them say like this. If God is unipersonal, think about this. If there's not three persons in one God, but God is unipersonal. Do you realize what this means? It means until the world began, there was no love, because love is something one person has for another. So until God created the world and other beings, you know, a unipersonal God did not love, which means love is not the essence of that God. Relationship is not the essence of that God. Therefore, the essence of that God is power and greatness. And therefore, unipersonal God, belief, tends to create moralism and absolutism, whereas secularism, so there is no God, produces relativism. Moralism, relativism, but the Trinity, dynamic, unity and diversity, is off the spectrum. Or another person said, uh, the idea that there's just one God, one unipersonal God, leads to individualism because the essence of God is he's an individual. And therefore, the most important thing in this world is my individual rights. But polytheism, there's many, many, many guys. You ever notice that in polytheistic um, uh, cultures, the family is all important. The tribe is all important. In other words, the unipersonal God makes an idol out of individual. The polytheism makes an idol out of the tribe or the family. 
But see, the triune God is not more fundamentally an individual than a community, not more fundamentally a community than an individual, and leads to a, a, a unique understanding of uh, human society. Now, aren't you glad I'm not going into those? Because if I did, it would make this more of a lecture than a sermon. Instead, what I'd like to do is give you one very, 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 very practical implication. If this world was made by a triune God, then relationships of love is what your life is really about. Do you know what the implication of that is? Relationships of love is what your life is all about. Uh, Recapitulate here. If there's no God... If the secularists are right, and you are here by blind chance, and you are here strictly as a result of natural selection, strictly, and it's not God doing natural selection, there is no God, you're just here because you evolved. Do you know what that means? What you and I call love is just a chemical condition of the brain. And the evolutionary biologist will tell you this, that there is nothing in us, there is nothing in us that isn't here strictly and totally because it helped our ancestors pass on the genetic code. Better than, better than others. And if you feel love, it's only because it enables you to survive and gets your body parts in the right places you need to be in order to pass on genetic code. And that's all love is. It's nothing but chemistry. But if God is unipersonal, as we just said, that means that there was a time in which God was not love until he created the world because love is something one person has for another. When there was only one person, there was no love, which means love is not of his essence. Love comes in second. It's secondary. It's peripheral. It's not the essence of God. Therefore, it's not the essence of reality. But if from all eternity, from all eternity, beginninglessly, that's a new word, beginninglessly (laughs) and endlessly, ultimate reality is a community of persons knowing and loving one another then that means that ultimate reality is about love relationships. Now, why is that important? Let me talk to you about it. You're, you, aren't you New Yorkers? Do you know what New York's about? You know what our culture is about? What New York's about and what our culture is about is relationships are nice, but we're here to get work done. Relationships are nice as long as they don't get in the way of your personal agenda and your individual rights and freedom and interests. Relationships are nice, but what's really important is money and power and achievement and accomplishment. So think of how many of the jobs, not just, in, not just in the corporate but in the creative side, that are structured so that if you're doing well, there is no time for relationships, not at all. During your money-making and your, 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 uh, your advancement periods of time, you don't have time not only for friendships, you don't even have time for marriages. Your marriages break up. But I want you to know, if, and we're all to some degree affected by this. I don't want you to think that you know, some people are awful and those of us who are holy, we have it all together. We're all affected. We all live here. But if you put money, you put accomplishment, you put your work, you put your career over development of lots and lots of rich friendships, over being deeply involved in a Christian community where there's accountability and responsibility, if you, if you put anything over uh, having a great family life because you've really invested in it, if you put anything over relationships, in the end, you're going to dash yourself on the rocks of reality because love is ultimate reality. You know, when Jesus said you have to lose yourself to find yourself, he's only telling you what the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have been doing from all eternity. You're never going to get a self. You're never going to get self-esteem. You're never going to get a sense of self by standing still and making everything orbit around your interests. Unless you are willing to experience the loss of options, the surrender, the limitation that comes from being in committed, deep relationships, the loss of money, the loss of time, the career you never really are able to have because of your relationships. Unless you're willing to put relationships first, you're out of touch with reality. You're going to come up empty. It's going to be ashes. You're going to be dashed on the rocks of reality. That's the implication that this world was not created by an individual God. It's not, that's not the process of an impersonal God that's an illusion. It's not an accident of violent random forces, but it was made by a God who is a community of persons who know and love each other from all eternity. This world is a divine dance. My wife and Peter Kreft, 
Peter Kraft of Boston College, philosopher, and my wife, Kathy Keller, have both said if they get a chance, and they probably won't, but if they get a chance and they can read something just as they're dying, they want to read the last pages of Paralandra, C.S. Lewis's second novel in his space trilogy, in which Lewis describes the universe as a great dance. Because what do you think the solar system is? What do you think the stars wheeling around are? What do you think the world, the planets spinning around are? What, what, do, you think this, what do you think the sea is back and forth? See, what do you think this, the birds are whirling around? What do you think the seasons are? It's a dance. We're made in the image of God. And God is not just an individual, but he's a community. So there's a dance. Secondly, we need more than anything else to be in the divine dance. Now, what do I mean by a divine dance? Up to now, I've been talking about, you, you know, you need, to, you, you need to exhibit, as Lewis says. In other words, you need to be in your relationships with others. You were made for mutually self-giving love, not self-centeredness. And so if you live a self-centered life, you're going to come up ashes. But let's go a little deeper. You were made to enter the divine dance. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's go back to this idea of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit glorifying each other. What does this glorify thing mean? That's a word that comes up all the time in the Bible and all the time in Christian circles. Do you know what it means? I mean, I, you know, nobody can put these things in a nutshell, but here's my version of it. When I think of what it means to glorify someone or something, I think of beauty and duty. And unless you, do, unless you understand both sides, you don't, you're not doing justice to the full semantic range of the word glorify. Beauty and duty. Beauty means adoring having your imagination captured by, finding gorgeous, praising, enjoying, doting on, see, praising. You're not glorifying something unless you find it beautiful for what it is in itself. And secondly, duty. You're not glorifying someone if you are serving them conditionally. When you say, I'll serve, I'll help, I'll do this, as long as I'm getting a benefit out of it, that's not glorifying them. That's not circling them. That's not the dance. That's not orbiting around them. That's really getting them to orbit around you. But, you know, there's a lot of us, a lot of us, you know, I'm certainly, at least one of my feet is in this circle. There's a lot of us that sure look unselfish because we can't say no, and we're saying yes to everything. And uh, people are always using us. And everybody says, oh, you're so, you know, you're so selfless. You're so giving of yourself. You're so, uh, you just need to be, you need to think more about yourself. Listen, those of us who don't have boundaries and who let people walk all over us and use us and that sort of thing and can't say no, you think we're doing that out of love for other people? We're doing it out of need. We need it. We're using them. It's out of fear and cowardice. No, 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 no. Look, um, To glorify means to unconditionally not use them as we're serving them, unconditionally serve them, not because we're getting anything out of it, just because of who they are. Just because of who they are. Now, because God, because God does not seek his own glory, but seeks the glory of others, because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all circling each other, glorifying each other, adoring each other, praising each other, serving each other, see, deferring to each other, because the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are giving glorifying love to one another, God is infinitely happy. Infinitely happy. Have you ever thought about him like that? You maybe not think of him like that, but, but think about this. If you find somebody who you adore and you think more of this person than anyone else in the world and you would do anything for that person and you discover that person feels the same way about you, does that feel good? That's heaven. And you know why it's heaven? Because it comes from this, because that's what they've been having. That's what God has in himself from all eternity. He's infinitely happy because he does not seek his own glory, but he seeks the glory of others. That's why he's infinitely happy, because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are mutually doing that with one another. Ah, you say, but wait a minute, wait a minute. If I say to you, God does not seek his own glory, but the glory of others, and then you open up the Bible, (laughs) wait a minute, wait a minute, every single page he's telling us, glorify me, serve me, adore me, praise me, every page. So how in the world can you stand up there, Tim Keller, and say that God doesn't seek his own glory? 
Of course he does. Of course he asks us to glorify him. Of course he asks us to serve him unconditionally. Of course he asks us to praise him. Of course he asks us beauty and duty toward him. Of course he asks us for all this. But now, finally, after all these years of hearing this, do you see why? Do you see why he's asking us to do this? Because he wants our joy. Why would a God like this create a world? If he was a unipersonal God, you might say, well, he's creating the world so he could have beings who give him worshipful love. But he already has that. And he has it far better from in, within himself, than we're, in far better form and more pure form and more powerful form than we're ever going to give it to him. See, if it was a unipersonal God, he might be, in, he might be uh, uh, creating a world in order to get the joy and infinite happiness of glorifying love. But he already has that. So why would he create us? And the answer is there's only one, there's only one answer. He must have created us not to get, but to give us his joy. He must have created us to get us into the dance, to invite us in, to say, if you glorify me, if you center your entire life on me, if you find me beautiful for who I am in myself, then you, have, you will step into the dance and this is what you're made for. You are made not just to believe in me in some general way and not just be spiritual in some general way, not just get a little bit of inspiration, not just pray when things are tough, not have just a cognitive belief. You are made to center everything in your life around me, to think of everything in terms of your relationship to me, everything, to obey me unconditionally. That's what you're made for. Are you in the dance or do you just believe in God? Are you in the dance or you just pray to him every, th- every so often when you're in trouble? Life is a dance, and you need to be more than anything else in the divine dance. That's what you're built for. Well, that's mind-blowing and actually kind of a neat image, this dance thing. Kind of nice, huh? Kind of, kind of cool. And yet, how do we get into the dance just because Tim Keller, the preacher, just because the Bible says glorify God when we're scared? Oh, we are scared. I remember some years ago uh, doing a Bible study, going through a Bible study book, and it was all about what it means to unconditionally give God the lordship of your life instead of just, you know, playing with God and, and, and you know, uh, believing in him in some general way, but really, really, really committing your life to him. And there was two questions. I mean, there were, actually, it was a contract. There, was, there were two statements, and underneath the statement, there was a place to sign and put a date and say, that's my contract with God. And you know what the two statements were? The first statement was, I promise to obey everything God says, whether I like it or not. And secondly, I promise to thank God for everything he sends into my life, whether I like it or not. I promise to obey everything he says and thank him for everything he sends, whether I like it or not. And then then there was this blank spot for you to sign your name and, and then put your date. That, unless you're an idiot, that is the most frightening page you could possibly confront. Do you know what it means? It's an invitation to the dance and we're scared. It's an invitation to instead of standing stationary and insisting, well, God, if I'll pray to you and I'll come to church and I'll do things if you, if you give me health and you give me what I want and all the things that I want. In other words, it's, not, it's an invitation to the dance. It's an invitation to orbit around him. And we're scared. Yes, we are. So how can we get into the dance? How can we, how can we take it? It's through Jesus, and here's why. Look, look what Jesus does. Verse 12 and 13. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beasts, and angels attended him. The temptation. Now, remember I said a minute ago, more than a minute ago, <clears throat> that Mark says, Mark is giving us a recapitulation of the, whole, of the whole history of the world. Think about it. You go back to Genesis, and after the Spirit moves across the face of the water and God speaks things into being, Right? And, the, and, and history is launched, what's the very next thing that happens? Satan, temptation, Garden of Eden. And here, the, at the moment of the ministry of Jesus Christ, 
the inauguration of the new creation, uh, the progenitor of a new humanity. He comes up out of the water. The Spirit moves upon him. Uh, God speaks, and bingo, same thing. Satan, temptation, trial. But notice the difference, and there is a big difference, between the first Adam and the second Adam. The first Adam was in a garden. The second Adam is in a wilderness. The first Adam, I guess, was with, you know, lammies who were, and lions who were, you know, uh, in wonderful harmony with human beings. But the second Adam is out there with the wild beasts. And this is Mark's way of saying that the second Adam had an infinitely harder probation, an infinitely harder test, an infinitely harder path to trod than the first Adam. And, of course, this temptation isn't over in verse 13, but it goes throughout through. The, he's assaulted by Satan the entire, his entire ministry, and it comes to a head and a conclusion, a climax, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the ultimate anti-garden to the Garden of Eden, you know, the, the, the alt-garden. And here's why. Think of the two tests. The first Adam was told, obey me about the tree. Now, what, why, was that, why was that the test? Remember? He says that God says to Adam and Eve, don't eat the tree. Why? Well, now we understand, I hope, tonight, God invented us to orbit around him, to serve him unconditionally, to center our lives on him, to be in a dance. And so when God says, don't eat this tree, what, what, is, what is our first response? Why not? God never says. And you know why? If you obey God, because you know it'll benefit you. Then what you're actually doing is you're being stationary. You're saying, well, okay, well, I, no, oh, I understand. Well, it makes sense. Now I see why I should obey, shouldn't eat the tree. Oh, if that happens, then this happens. Of course, of course. Guess what? You're stationary. God is a means to an end. He's not an end in himself. Well, so what God is saying is, don't eat the tree just because you love me. Just because I say so. Just for me. And we failed. Satan encouraged us to fail because Satan came along and says, this idea of self-giving love where you make yourself totally vulnerable and you orbit around other people, that'll never work. And you know that? You know, you, know, you can look at Adam and Eve and say, what idiots? Why do they listen to Satan? And yet what, we, you still have Satan's lie in your own heart because we're, we're afraid to. We're afraid of trusting God like that. We're afraid of trusting anybody. We're stationary. Because Satan told us to be stationary. He says it works. It hasn't, of course. Because when our relationship with God unraveled after the Garden of Eden, all other relationships unravel. Relationships politically between nations, relationships socially between races and classes, relationships personally between friends and, and, and even family members are always blowing up. They're always blowing up. Why? Because we're all, we all want to be little centers. You know, a, a solar system in which every planet insists that everything revolve around them isn't a solar system, it's a solar cataclysm. And a world in which everyone says, everything's got to revolve around me is a world in which the dance is impossible. But God did not leave us there. The Son of God was born into the world. The second Adam. And now think about this. God says to the first Adam, obey me about the tree. God says to the second Adam, obey me about the tree. Only this time the tree is a cross. God says to the first Adam, obey me about the tree, and you will live. And he didn't. And God says to the second Adam, obey me about the tree, and I'll crush you to powder. And he did. And I want you to consider this. When Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins, what was he getting out of it? Oh, you say he was getting worshipers, self-glorifying, you know, he's getting glorifying love from us, you know, but later on we were going to pray. Uh, he's he's a, the Trinity. Let's remember the Trinity. He already had that. He already had glorifying love. What did he get out of us? What did he get from dying for us? What was the benefit? Nothing, which means at that point he began to glorify us. He circled us. He orbited around us. Jesus Christ. Now, it's what he was doing from all eternity with the Father and the Son, but now he moves out to do it to us. And he honors us, and he centers on us, and he unconditionally loves us. He loves us not because he gets anything out of it, but just for who we are. If you see that, really, and if it becomes a beautiful thing to you, you have begun to enter the dance. Because, see, when Jesus died on the cross, he was coming to you and saying, shall we dance? 
When Jesus Christ was, went onto the cross, he moved toward us and invited us to dance. And, and to the degree that that moves you and gets you out of your fear and begins to break apart the satanic lie that's in all of our hearts that, 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 fe- that keeps us stationary, and you begin to orbit him as he's begun to orbit you, you, be- you get pulled into the life of the Trinity. And that's how it's done. That's how it's done. <sighs> Jesus Christ moves toward us. That's the beginning of the dance for us on the cross. Then we move toward him in repentance and faith. We say, I believe in you. Then he moves toward us again. It's called justification by faith. He dotes on us and delights in us, not because of our good works, but just because we're in him. John chapter 17 is a place where Jesus says, Father, I've given them the glory you gave me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. He glorifies us. There, there it is. John chapter 17, verses 21 to 24. And he says, Father, I know now that you will love them even as you love me, even as you love me. God does not look at us in terms of our own record. When you see Jesus dying on the cross, this is what it means to be a Christian. When you say, Father, I'm not going to try. You don't say, now, Lord, I'm going to try hard to be a good person. You say, Father, accept me, not for not because of my record, but because of Jesus' record, not because of what I have done, but because of what Jesus has done, except me for his sake. At that point, Jesus, who's moved out to you, you move toward him in repentance and faith, and God again moves around you and says, I del- he delights in you. He, pr- he delights in you. You're precious to him. You're as beautiful to him as a gorgeous bride to his groom. That's what the Bible says over and over again. And then you start to obey him, and live a life out of the assurance of this love. This, you see it going? Do you see the dance? And sometimes when you pray, the very same thing happens to Christians that happen to Jesus. Sometimes when we're about to go through a hard time or when we're in a hard time, Romans 8, 8, 16 says, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. Romans 8 says, the, uh, Romans 5, excuse me, says, The love of Jesus Christ is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And what this means is sometimes when we're in trouble and we pray, it doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes we hear in the depths of our being, this is my beloved child. You are my beloved child whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. You can't survive without being part of that dance. You'll die if you're not part of that dance. Let's uh, conclude this way. What does this mean? If the, if, the, if the creation is the project of the triune God and redemption is the project of the triune God, it means three things. Number one, you're never really going to come to grips with a God like this as an individual. You've got to be in a community. You can't just come to church and get, you know, goodies and blessings from the music and the teaching unless you are part of a community of people who are showing Christ to each other. I mean, how in the world could you know a God who is a community except in a community, really in a community? That's number one. Number two, learn how to praise. Make sure your prayer life is filled with praise. Be very careful that your prayer life, which it does, doesn't, just, doesn't get squeezed out by all your petitions, all the things you need. If the Bible's right and the creation is the result and the redemption is the result of, of a of a community of beings who have so much joy in mutually self-giving love that creation is a result of that, then basically do you realize we were all rejoiced into being? Praise and joy is what life's about. And if you are willing to learn how to praise God and enjoy God and adore God for what he's done for you and what he will do for you and what he's done in you, you may find that instead of moving out into the world, always griping about everything and always finding fault with everyone and always be complaining about everything that's going on in your life, you will become a praising person, an affirming person. G- uh, C.S. Lewis says, praise is inner health made audible. So community, learn to praise, and actually give your life to Jesus even if it's going to bring problems. Bill Lane, my old New Testament professor, uh, years ago when I was in seminary, pointed out that only in Mark does it say that Jesus was with the wild beasts. It seems, it's, it's kind of an unnecessary statement, isn't it? Matthew, Mark, John, nobody else, Matthew, Luke, and John, they have no reference to it. In the description of Jesus' temptation, what's the wild, what are they doing there? Who needs that? What, what, how does that help? 
And the answer is that at the time when Mark was writing to Christians, they were being thrown to wild beasts. And so they were, I mean, therefore, you know, Christians aren't, even back then, they weren't all heroes. They were sitting around saying, well, maybe, maybe instead of really unconditionally obeying God, I ought to just do it, you know, I ought to just compromise here and there, and that way I'll never be thrown into wild beasts. And Mark is saying, no, 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 no. He'll walk with you in the lion's den. Obey him unconditionally. Praise him thoroughly. Wait for him in community. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this cosmic vision of who you are and what we are called to be and what the universe is really about. And we are so grateful that this means that if we embrace you in the future, there's going to be joy. Because this world is going, to, this world is heading for a party. It's heading for a feast. It's heading uh, for love. It's heading for joy. It's heading for fellowship. Uh, we are not going to someday lose our individuality and drop off into the impersonal all soul. We're not going to. It's not when we die we're going to rot and go to nothing. We are bound for this, the interior life of the triune God. And we thank you for that. And we ask that you would help us to live in accordance with this ultimate reality. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening today. Gospel and Life's ministry is supported by generous partners all over the world. Your gifts allow us to share the gospel message with millions of people through our podcast, radio, and other channels, including here on YouTube. We're seeing God change lives through the increasing reach of this ministry, so thank you for your part in it. If you'd like to make a gift today, go to gospelandlife.com slash YouTube, and we'll send you one of my books as thanks for your gift. Thank you again for your generous support, because the gospel really does change everything.